In the 1860s, the final pieces of the puzzle of light seemed to fall into place, thanks to the work of the Scottish theoretical physicist James Clerk Maxwell. What Maxwell found was a set of relationships, four simple-looking formulas, known ever since as Maxwell's equations, that bind electricity and magnetism inextricably together. These equations explain, for example, all the results of the pivotal experiments on electric currents and magnetic fields that Michael Faraday had carried out in the 1830s at the Royal Institution. Maxwell's equations assume that around magnets, electric charges and currents, there exist regions of influence known as fields. Crucially, the equations show that it's meaningless to talk about these fields on their own. Wherever there's an electric field, there's always an accompanying magnetic field at right angles to it, and vice versa. The two can't exist apart, and together they produce a marriage called an electromagnetic field. As Maxwell's equations make clear, change the electric field and the magnetic field responds by changing as well. The disturbance to the magnetic field then causes a further shift in the electric field and so on, back and forth, action and reaction. Maxwell was aware of the implication of this two-way feedback. It meant that any fluctuations in an electric or magnetic field give rise to electromagnetic waves. The frequency of these waves equals the rate at which the electromagnetic field waxes and wanes. Using his formulas, Maxwell could even figure out the speed at which electromagnetic waves should travel, 300,000 kilometers per second. But this value was already very familiar in science. It was equal to the speed of light, which by the mid 19th century was known quite accurately. And there was no way Maxwell was going to take that as mere coincidence. In 1867, he proposed that light waves were none other than electromagnetic waves. We can scarcely avoid the conclusion, he said, that light consists in the transverse undulations of the same medium which is the cause of electric and magnetic phenomena. Nor did it end with visible light. Maxwell's equations implied there ought to be a broad span of electromagnetic radiation stretching from very long wavelengths to very short ones. Think of the electromagnetic spectrum as being like the keyboard of a piano, with the rainbow of visible light from red to violet akin to a single octave somewhere in the middle. Sadly, Maxwell didn't live to see his prediction that there must be other types of electromagnetic radiation bear fruit because he died of abdominal cancer in 1879 at the age of only 48. What's more, as in the case of Thomas Young, his discoveries were never properly appreciated during his lifetime, especially by his compatriots. Most contemporary scientists, including Lord Kelvin, the top scientific dog of the day, didn't accept Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, and not many understood the mathematics behind his equations. In Britain, he had the support of only a small circle of scientists. Nine years after Maxwell's death, however, the truth and power of his equations were borne out. The German physicist Heinrich Hertz found notes at the low, long wavelength end of the electromagnetic keyboard in the form of radio waves, which he produced by making sparks fly back and forth between two brass electrodes. In 1895, another German, Wilhelm Röntgen discovered what turned out to be radiation from the short wavelength end of the spectrum, X-rays. By the close of the 19th century, the particle theory of light looked to be dead in the water. Maxwell's electromagnetic theory had been fully vindicated, and there no longer seemed to be any doubt that light was purely a form of wave motion. But then something extraordinary happened. Just when scientists were beginning to feel smug about having all the cosmic laws in their grasp, cracks began to appear in the vast fortress of Victorian physics. Experimental results that defied explanation in terms of known science. Minor at first, these cracks widened until it became clear that the old scientific edifice seemingly so secure 
would have to be torn down to its foundations and replaced by something new and disturbingly alien. I'll be talking about what happened next in my series on the birth of quantum theory. <laughs>